Forgettable Bean School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Hensel Co-op. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to the Edible Bean School. Today, we are talking weed control, specifically Canada fleabane. Pre-emerge and in-crop options to control the pest are limited, but new University of Guelph weed researcher Isabel Aikland is looking to change that. On this episode, Aikland is joined by OMAFA weed specialist Mike Cobra to discuss her goals to identify better management options for Canada fleabane control in dry beans. And she's seeing some good things in the first year of her research plot. We're amongst a really thick uh, patch of glyphosate-resistant Canada fleabane. We know a ton of work has been done in corn and soybeans. And I know, I know you've had questions this spring, and I have as well, from producers in dry beans wanting to know how to manage it before they even plant uh, dry beans. So, yeah. you know, just what are you doing here uh, at this site trying to figure out to answer some of those questions? Yeah, so one of the biggest challenges for uh, Canada fleabane is that there are uh, limited herbicide options for dry bean producers, uh, both pre-emergence and uh, in crop. So the idea here is that we're looking at a few different herbicide active ingredients that are not registered uh, for pre-plant burn down for Canada fleabane uh, to see one, if there is uh, efficacy for controlling the Canada flea vein, but two, uh, if there would be an acceptable level of crop safety uh, for white beans. Just uh, started this study this year, so uh, right now we can really just draw differences in terms of what treatments are effective on Canada flea vein. Uh, the next part of this will be evaluating the crop safety, and then uh, the third phase that I see would be looking at how do we actually integrate this into uh, management practices. So how does this look in a system uh, with tillage or in a no-till or uh, reduced till situation? So to me, this is the most impressive tr treatment. We're now sitting at three weeks after application. If you compare it to the non-sprayed area, pr pretty impressive. I know for me, I was here seven days after and out of the gate, I'm like, oh, you've picked, you've, yeah. you've picked an amazing treatment. Speak to me what was in that that might have made me so optimistic initially. Yep. So this is a combination of a contact uh, and a systemic herbicide. So contact herbicides, you're going to get that leaf burn, and they're especially um, effective on small uh, weeds versus with the systemic, you're getting more of that uh, internal movement of the herbicide. And so that should uh, help, especially with those larger plants. Um, what what is important to note here is uh, the size of the weeds when you're applying the treatments, uh, because that will uh, determine the efficacy over time. Do you mind like if we can just go in here and take yep. a close-up because there's some weird things now that I'm seeing at three weeks after yep. that maybe aren't getting me as warm and fuzzy as I was two weeks yep. ago so For let's sure. take a look. All right so we're at three weeks after application this is what got me not feeling as great. Uh, you know why do we have a bunch of regrowth here whereas some of these other ones look uh, pretty dead and and done. Mm -hmm. So, so that mainly comes down to how the herbicide works. So uh, as we were just discussing uh, with that contact herbicide, you're going to uh, want to target smaller weeds uh, that will come in contact with the growing point. Um, but as with a systemic herbicide, it's going to be more on that uh, internal movement. And what we're seeing is that there's some uh, regrowth, uh, some side shoots that are emerging as um, the plant was probably a bit bigger when it was sprayed. Right, so size is incredibly important. I mean, realistically, we were in here at a pretty good time, I yeah. thought, like the, on the bigger side, but not unlike what growers have to deal with. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, what, what are some things that we can look at in terms of trying to improve control, getting these sprayed at the right stage, or maybe even helping this out after? Is there something we could do afterwards? Yep. Like, where do you see this research project going in terms of trying to, to deal with this kind of stuff? Right. So uh, what I see um, going forward is once we've kind of identified some of these treatments that are looking promising, I would say, generally speaking, this pot is looking fairly promising for control. Um, what might help uh, in a management situation is to uh, incorporate tillage, so later on uh, at planting, and then um, that will help 
some of these weeds that are a bit damaged but starting to regrow, uh, that will help uh, uproot them and potentially improve control. So I doubt any farmer would look at this, uh, Isabel, and say, amazing, uh, show me this herbicide, but um, it is interesting, like it's a bit slower to act. Over three yeah. weeks, it keeps getting, uh, the symptoms get more pronounced and pronounced. I notice it's more of like a, a whitening, yellowing symptoms. Uh, why, why is this treatment in here and, and what are you hoping to learn from it? So what we're hoping to get out of this treatment is that it's a new active ingredient that's not uh, registered for dry beans, uh, but could potentially fit. So although um, the control isn't necessarily great, uh, it is an interesting uh, option. And of course, this is only the first year that we're doing this study. So uh, it needs to be replicated over a, a couple of years to really get a sense of whether this could be an effective treatment. But it's just to highlight that this is uh, potentially a new option uh, to incorporate. Looks to me like it's a different mode of action. Is that part of why it's in here? Is yep. like a lot of what we've been looking at are we're limited. It's dry beans. Yep. It has to be safe on the crop. Yep. Um, so I guess what would you, knowing that it's not maybe amazing here, what kind of adjustments would you look at next year or down the road to, to uh, kind of investigate further? Well, it would be interesting to look at over the course of several years just for a sense of whether this is a one-off or whether this truly is um, the efficacy with this treatment. Um, and it's also important to note it, it would be great to have another uh, mode of action to include, uh, just given the limitations that dry bean growers already have. Um, and so that was kind of the thought process for this treatment. In general, uh, in this study, uh, we kind of chose herbicide options that have presented low levels of uh, crop injury in dry beans, but that could, based on literature and previous data, could have potential activity on fleabane as well. So the last question I had for you, Isabel, is like, I look at this mess of fleabane in here, it's all branched and tall, tough to kill in the spring. Is there anything we could have done uh, differently to, to not put us in this situation, especially going into dry beans? So uh, using fall management, so that would be a combination of a herbicide application and tillage can be effective for controlling a Canada fleabane, uh, specifically um, a burn down with glyphosate and uh, distinct or a dicamba product um, can be quite effective. The only thing you need to watch out for is the uh, plant back interval. Right, and I think something like glyphosate distinct as a maybe a 30 day plant back, so that should be fine. So the idea is you apply that in the fall, maybe till afterwards, yep. and then hopefully we're in a situation in the spring that we're in a much better shape. Is yep. that, yeah, the concept? Very cool, I appreciate you spending the time to show me around this and, and what you've learned so far. I really look forward to how this progresses and what you find to help uh, dry bean growers manage uh, glyphosate resistant can of flea bane. So yeah. thanks. Yeah, thank you.